So, for the sake of our YouTube viewers, uh, we're continuing, like we say, our Bible Buddies series. We're going to look at two other Bible Buddies today uh, and what we can learn from them and their stories or part of their stories. The first Bible Buddy, like I said, that I want to look at today is Michael, the daughter of King Saul. Now, just to explain, uh, it's spelled Michael, M A, sorry, M I C H A L. So it's a girl, right? We're it's a girl. Uh, and she was the youngest daughter of King Saul in the Old Testament. She ended up marrying David. We know David, don't we, of Goliath fame, who would later succeed Saul as king of Israel and Judah. Today's story that we're looking at is set in a really big day for God's people and for King David. We read that the Ark of the Covenant is being brought back into Jerusalem. Now some of you will know about the Ark of the Covenant because you'll have read about it in the Bible, but many of us will think of the Raiders of the Lost Ark <coughs> with Harrison Ford and uh, the film, don't we? That will be your opinion of what the Ark is regarding that film, but anyway, the reality is, the Ark of the Covenant, it's Old Testament, the reality is it's a gold-plated wooden box that was home, or supposed to be home, of the two tablets given to Moses, which had the Ten Commandments on them. <coughs> but in some ways, it was more than that, actually, in the Old Testament, when you look at it, because it was symbolic in many ways. It was symbolic of God's presence with his people. It was symbolic of God's protection and blessing on his people. And it had to be looked after, and it even had to be carried in a certain way. <coughs> if you read the story a little bit more, you'll see that the ark, as it was being carried from one place to the other, at one point it kind of slightly tips, and a guy reaches out to try and just stop it, and he touches the ark, and because he does that with his bare hands, he's struck dead. I'm not going into that, that's too complicated for me <laughs> today. But today we read that finally the Ark is returning to Jerusalem. And King David is celebrating and he's dancing. But what about his wife, Michael? Let's just read that verse 16 again. As the Ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, was watching from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. Ooh. <laughs> She's a Bible buddy you see today. So two things, because like I say, I want to go on to talk a little bit about some of so I'll try and keep it quite tight as I look at two different people today. And as we look at Michael, the first thing I want to say really is, who cares about worship? And I want to say, you can say that in two ways, can't you? You can say, who cares about worship? You go, who cares about worship? You can kind of use it in two different ways. I love the fact that as the Ark comes into the city of uh, Jerusalem, David is celebrating, he's dancing, he's worshipping, and contrary to what some people think, he wasn't doing this naked, all right? Because I know some people seem to think that he was doing this in the all together in his birthday suit. So he wasn't. We're told that he's wearing, he was wearing a uh, linen ephod, which was a type of apron worn by a Jewish high priest. But when you read about this, if you kind of picture it in your mind, and David's getting excited, the act's returning, he's worshipping God, he's having a dance, he's getting excited. To me, it kind of just speaks of the word joy, and it speaks of the word freedom. But you can imagine all this is going on, and then David goes home. And who's waiting for him? Well, it's Michael, his wife. I think she's probably like this. <laughs> Doesn't say that in the Bible, but I think she's like this. <laughs> because, listen to what happens. When David returned home, to bless his household, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from the house 
when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel, I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke, I will be held in honour. There used to be a song by the Christian group called Delirious, and they used to sing, I will become even more undignified than this. And they're all crammed and going potting when we sing it. So you get this idea, you see, that David just didn't care in some ways. And I mean that in a good way. It wasn't that, oh, he didn't care. He just didn't care what people were thinking. I think he was following the words of Mark Twain, though Mark Twain seemed to come a little bit later. <laughs> But Mark Twain said, dance like nobody's watching, love like you've never been hurt, sing like nobody's listening, live like it's heaven on earth. But actually David was dancing freely and joyfully for an audience. He was dancing for an audience of one, for his God, for his Lord. And I wonder how might this challenge us, firstly, how we approach worship today. Will we be like David, or will we be like Michael? See, Michael was not happy with David. And maybe sometimes we feel uncomfortable when we see people worshipping in a style that's different from our own. Because there's all kinds of styles, isn't there? There is exuberant worship with raising of hands and clapping. And then there are those who prefer a more traditional, formal style, or even a more meditative approach. Or even what we might call a bouncing off the ceiling approach. There's all kinds of styles, isn't there? Do we ever feel offended? How different people worship God? Or do we just love the variety of expression in God's people to our God? Or are we like David? Are we free in worship? Whatever that freedom might look like, for each of us. And I think it is different for different people. It probably isn't for most people dancing around in a linen effort, if I'm honest. <laughs> but are we free? That's an important question. You know, I think about sometimes people putting their hands up. You know, if you've never put your hands up in worship, just put your hand up now. There you go. See, you get the song going. Quick, quick, get the song going. <laughs> <laughs> But sometimes, you know, I mean, you don't have to put your hands up in worship. Of course you don't. But I think some people would like to, but they're like, oh, I just don't know. Why do they do that? And it's just a sense sometimes of just, it's, a, it's an expression. It's a, you know, you don't have to. It doesn't mean any more holy or more worshipful or anything like that. But I think some people, there's just, it does allow a freedom sometimes in some people. Are we free in worship? Whatever that looks like to us. And does our worship come from a well of joy? And is our worship for an audience, or is our worship for an audience of one? The second thing that we see about Michael is that she just wasn't joining in the celebrations. She was at the window, she was a spectator. And I remember a long time ago doing a, a Christian family talk, you know when you get all the kids in and you do a talk, and my talk was all about the Tater family. And I was asking people, what sort of Christian Tater are you? As in potato, you see? Because there's all kinds of stuff. There's, a, there's the imitator, and the facilitator, and the dictator, and the devastator, and the hesitator, and the irritator, and the commentator. There's all kinds of taters. And I remember doing this family service based on what sort of Christian tater are you? We're all our potatoes. The key is not to be a spectator, isn't it? But to be a willing participator in worship. Whether it be in our singing of worship, or whether it be in our worship of giving, or serving, or our lifestyles. Are we free? Are we participating? Where does that come from? Because as you said, the second thing we really want to look at when it comes to Michael, is that there seems to be an issue in the heart. Why was Michael not happy? Why was she not joining in? Why did she become what seemed to be such a critic in this situation. Well, the suggestion is that she had a heart issue. The suggestion is that actually she was stranded in, was a product of, was weighed down by her past. Her anger, her critical attitude, actually had come through her history. You know, she was always known as Michael, daughter of Saul, not 
wife of David, for example. Perhaps suggesting that she actually never got past her past. She never really got her own identity. Also, we're told that actually men didn't treat Michael very well. Her own father was quite a violent and unpredictable man. You know, in some ways, we're all products, aren't we, of our past, of our histories. Our histories can play, have a big influence on who we are today. If we're honest, for some people, they will carry this with them in unhealthy ways. Was this the reason that resentment and bitterness had infiltrated and was capped out on the heart of Michael? We know, don't we, that this can happen, that when we have those things in us, it can imprison us, it can lay heavy on us, it can burn in us. When we feel bitter, when we feel jealous, when we feel angry because of things that have gone on before us. I wonder who uncomfortable as it might be can relate a little bit to Michael today. That their past, that our damaged identity <coughs> in some ways has, has given root in us to resentment or bitterness. And it has and it continues <coughs> to hurt us. So what can we do? Because in some ways, trying to, I realise when you sort of look at these people and I try and do these two little mini messages all in one, you know, in one time, these are massive issues. It's a really big issue. And you can go into this and you should, in some ways, go into this in a lot more levels. But what can we do? What can we do is maybe something of Michael and, and some of that that's captured her heart and we can relate a little bit to what can we do? Well, I think we need to go gently. But I do think we need to start a journey, we need to go on a process. Perhaps we need to ask for help. I hope we would ask God for help with some of those things. Maybe we need to ask a friend to help us, to talk to us about it. Maybe we need to forgive somebody. Maybe we need to let go of something. Maybe we need to let something in. Maybe we need to bless somebody, you know? Somebody who's hurt us because as we bless them, then we have that release. Somebody once said, go with what might not fit you, go with what you might not feel like doing. Go with what is right. As in the end, we become the first beneficiaries. You know, if we're carrying any bitterness or hurt or our identity being misshaped and it's not in line with what God's identity for us is, maybe we need to take a journey and we need to start moving forward in that. Because if we don't, we'll just dig deeper. It will just, and the effects of that come out in all kinds of ways. For Michael, she became a critic, she became bitter. You know, Michael, we're told, was barren. Not because of actually, we don't, there's no suggestion that she was barren because of her bitterness. But it's, I wonder if we live with a bitter life, then often people will experience some forms of emotional or spiritual or relational barrenness. May we allow God to minister to us, to heal us, to set us free, to melt those things away. Big topics, I'm really sorry that it's done it in a, in a sort of, I feel like I've not done it justice. But maybe we can learn from Michael today, for some people. Maybe we just need to learn to be free in our worship. To let go of it. To raise that. Go on, let's have a go and see what happens. Hey. <laughs> Just an option. But maybe too, we need to look at ourselves and say, if we're being critical, if we're being, you know, if we're hurting, why is that? What can God, how can God help us to release something of that so that it plays well in us rather than hurts us and unfortunately hurts other people around us? I really sad the fact that Saul asked um, Michael to marry David because. Because basically he, he kind of said, look, if I can get Michael to marry David, then David was kind of Saul's enemy. He was kind of saying, I'll get Michael to marry him because she will hurt Saul. She will hurt David. How did he know that? Because she was hurting herself. <coughs> hurt people, hurt other people. So if we're hurting, let God help us with that. And one way of doing that, I think worship really helps us, and now we're going to sing and we'll move on to look at Judas as well. And, uh, 
you know, as we worship, let God meet with us and minister to us. And as we free ourselves up in worship, sometimes we just let the Holy Spirit, <coughs> just that permission to come and meet us wherever we are, whatever situation we're in. So let's let's worship and then we'll move on a little bit to look at our next Bible back. Man, arrest him. 
Going just once to Jesus, Jesus said, Greeting, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. Now, when you think about Judas, and we kind of know Judas' story quite a lot of his life, well, one of the things I kind of ask is, why, why did Jesus do what he did? Jesus do what he did. Why did Judas, a disciple of Jesus, betray him? What was the motive behind this Bible body? <clears throat> why did he betray Jesus? Was he just a shady character? And in some ways you might think, well, Jesus knew that it was a bit of a shady character. For, so was this just part of God's kind of pre-arranged big plan for the journey towards the cross? So, Jesus, you know, we needed, Jesus picked him because he knew that he'd betray him. And then it was part of the plan because that was part of the way to the cross, wasn't it? Or did he do it, did Jesus do it just for the money? Again, we know that Judas was corrupt. John 12, verse 6, you know when the lady comes in, uh, the prostitute comes in and pours perfume, expensive per perfume on Jesus' feet. Who complains? It's Judas. He says this, and he has a bit of a complaint. And then he says, he did not complain, and he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, a keeper of the money bag. He used to help himself to what was put into it. So we kind of knew that he was a bit of a thief, so maybe he was just in it for the money. That's why he sold Jesus off, betrayed Jesus to the authorities. But today I think I just want to look at it briefly from a slightly different angle. And it's this, the first thing. God, can you do what I want? God, can you do what I want? See, one other idea why Jesus betrayed Jesus was that his actions were about trying to provoke Jesus' hand. He was trying to force Jesus into a situation where Jesus did just what Judas wanted him to do. And what was that? Well, he wanted Jesus to be a military leader who would overthrow the Romans. We remember, don't we, that for many of God's people, in the Old Testament idea or, or the expectation or the hope for the coming Messiah would be that he would be a military leader, that he would fight the Romans and get the people free. And we have this situation, was Jesus trying to, was Judah trying to put Jesus in a situation where Jesus suddenly was like, enough's enough, rebel, because that's what Peter did, didn't he? Peter said, right, let's get the sword out and chop the ear off. There's this idea that Judas was just trying to control and was to manage to manipulate God for his will. Was he trying to push and provoke and force Jesus into a situation where his response would be just as Judas wanted to take on and fight the Romans? You know, there's other examples of this from the disciples. When Jesus was explaining to his disciples about the fact that he had to go to Jerusalem and he had to suffer, what did uh, Peter say? Oh, no, 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 never. Peter, Peter said, I won't let that happen, Jesus. What did Jesus say to him? Get ye behind me, Satan. See, G Peter was saying, no, no, I, I, I want to control the situation. I don't need to go and suffer. And Jesus was like, no, you can't control the situation. This was my way. Oh, can you remember when the children were coming up to Jesus and the disciples were like pushing them away, saying, okay, oh, you ain't got time for these children, you ain't got time for that. They were trying to control Jesus, you see, but what did Jesus do? He said, come on, let the children come to me. In fact, we all need to be like children when we come to people. So I think it's a really quick, important question. Do we ever try and do this with Jesus and God? Do we ever try and get God to do what we want? It's interesting, the guy on the DVD, when he explains this, he talks about the fact, he talks a little bit about teaching his son to drive. Now, some of us have had this experience when we teach our uh, siblings to, to drive, don't we? Uh, a little bit. And he said that it's really difficult. He said, even being in the car with his son after his son had passed the test, he said, the guy said, I still don't feel very comfortable. I still, I'm still not at rest. He says in the car. And he says, sometimes I still just want to grab the wheel. <laughs> you know, when we become Christians, sometimes we say, don't we? Jesus, take the wheel of our lives. There's a song thing. Carry on with Jesus, take the wheel. 
But then how many times do we try and grab the wheel back and say to Jesus, uh, hang on Jesus, I'd rather go this direction. You know, often when I'm driving home from somewhere, and it happened when we were coming back from New Wine, the rest of the car decide they will go to sleep. <laughs> now in some ways that's not a bad thing, I don't mind that actually. Because in some ways you hope that it's a good thing that they're actually in that place, they're trusting me, they're, they feel safe enough in the car, they feel at the rest in the car to be able to go to sleep and trust that I'm going to carry on and get them home safely. And I think there's a question there, are we in that place of rest? Are we in that place of safety, trusting, allowing Jesus to sit in the driving seat of our lives? Or do we try and control it? Do we try and say, no Jesus, this, this is what we need to do. This is the way we need to go. Or do we say to Jesus, no Jesus, I want to trust you. I want you to be in the driving seat of my life. And I want to be at rest in that place to know that actually where we're going, you're in control. And I'm at peace with that. I feel safe with that. I'm at rest in that. That's a hard discipline. And I think when I thought about it myself, I think I can switch around. So sometimes I'm in that place, and sometimes I'm like, oh, Jesus, where are we going? And we kind of jump a little bit and learn a little bit. But it's really difficult to, to try and stop ourselves from trying to control Jesus in a way that we would want. Because I think this jumps to my second point when I look at Judas, and it's really this. Are we prepared to let God disappoint us? That's a massively challenging question. Are we prepared to let God disappoint us? See, it would seem for Judas that Jesus was disappointing him. He wasn't doing what he felt Jesus should do. You know, if you've ever seen the, the, uh, the musical Jesus Christ Superstar, G Judas has two songs in, the, in, the, in the, uh, the musical Jesus Christ Superstar. And I think he gets the best songs, Judas. You know, I kind of feel if I was in Jesus Christ Superstar, I'd kind of like to play Judas because he gets the best songs. Because one of the first, like the first song, which is the first song in Jesus Christ Superstar is a song called Heaven on Their Mind. And Judas is singing to Jesus. And he says things like this, listen, I should sing it to you, man. I'm so tempted to sing it. I sing it. I sing it. I sing it. Let's see where a few more disappear. Here we go. Listen, Jesus, I don't like what I see. All I ask is that you listen to me. And remember, I've been your right hand man all along. You have set them all on fire. They think they found the new Messiah. And they'll hurt you when they find you're wrong. And I could go on, but I won't anyway. <laughs> what, what Judas is doing is, what Jesus is doing is, in the song, is he's, he's questioning Jesus. He's saying, Jesus, you're not doing it the way I should. In the way that you should. He feels let down by the fact that he has this expectation, this assumption that Jesus should do his things this way and, and this is what he should be doing. And he's disappointed in Jesus. See, in the, in the end, I think Jesus, Judas, sorry, just had the wrong assumption of Jesus. And this resulted in his disappointment. And that disappointment in Jesus led to a dramatic action of the betrayal. I wonder if this can ever happen to us as Christians today. We sometimes have the wrong assumption with Jesus. He might not go along with our agenda. So what happens then? What happens when God or Jesus disappoints us? When he doesn't do what we think he should. When he doesn't answer the prayer in the way that we think or hope. When he doesn't take us out of that situation that we're in and we're desperate to be out of it. When he doesn't zap that person that we've been asking him to zap for ages. Come on, Jesus, zap them. When Jesus disappoints us, what will our response be? And we have free will, you see, so we always have choice. Will we be offended? Will we take the hope? Will we withdraw our worship and withdraw our service, which 
Will we withdraw um, our giving? See, Judas ended up leaving, and in fact, worse than that. And I've seen this happen in many of God's people, many of God's children over time, and it's heartbreaking when it does. Things don't go the way that they feel maybe they wanted God to, to sort them out in a certain way. And what happens is, sometimes they leave. They leave the fellowship of being in God's church. Heartbreaking when we see that. Will we be like that? Or when things don't go the way we think, will we hang on? Will we hold on? Will we keep trusting? Will we keep worshipping? Will we keep serving? Will we keep following? Will we keep attending? Will we keep praying? Even if God seems to be going in a different direction to what we think he should. Will we keep trusting that in the end, God does know what he's doing? That God is always sovereign. And even if we don't see it, even if we don't understand it in the moment, to be honest, sometimes we might not even see it until we get to the day of eternity and we can watch the DVD back again. But in that place, when sometimes we just can't understand what God is doing or Jesus is doing or we feel he's let us down in some ways because he's not answered the prayer. And we've been praying the prayer for so long. Or he's not taken us from that place where we think, oh, I, I, God, we need to do something here. And he's not seemed to have done it. What will we do? Will we, will we betray Jesus in some ways? Or will we hold on to him? And trust him and continue to do so. Many of you know that um, growing up, one of my favourite hymns as a good Methodist. There's a few of us around still in that Margaret. One of my favourite hymns, and I, you know, when I when I left Harrogate to um, to start a year out skiing, and then my church sent me out. This is the hymn I chose. When I came here to be um, the, the pastor here, and they said, "Let's give it a couple of weeks and see what happens." And we'll take this. <laughs> this was the hymn I chose. It's the hymn when we walk with the Lord. Some of you know it well. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds in our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, because there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. And the, the, the song goes on, but the challenge is to trust and obey in all the circumstances. Mm -hmm. That's hard. Even when we feel a bit let down or we're not, we don't understand. To keep trusting, to keep obeying, to keep worshipping, to keep serving, to keep attending, to keep praying, to keep opening up our Bibles. Say, God, I have no idea sometimes, but I still believe that you do. And I'm going to hang on and trust. And if I see it down the line, thank you. But if I don't, until I get to eternity, still thank you. I trust you.